Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. I recently celebrated my 27th birthday, uh, which my husband has made sure to remind me repeatedly, puts me now firmly in my late 20s rather than my mid 20s. Um, And while I know late 20s are not old by any means, I'm certainly starting to feel my age more and more, you know? Like, I just can't get in a Snapchat, no matter how hard I try. And despite my teenage sister's best efforts, I am dismally bad at TikTok dances. Instead, a fun Saturday morning for me now is going to Ikea and getting new shelves or picking up a fire pit at Home Depot. I talk about yard work and complain about traffic conditions regularly. And even when I have free time, I spend it doing old lady embroidery surrounded by cats. And, you know, if I'm being honest, it's not like I was cool before 27. Much like Nick Miller of New Girl, I'm simply aging into my personality. And one of the symptoms of advancing adulthood that you might have felt as well is the struggle to spend any quality time with my friends. Before college, I just saw my friends in class, so no additional plans required. And in undergrad, it was like a little more complicated, but I still saw my friends in class or at church or in clubs or just, you know, at home with my roommates. But now it can be nigh impossible to find real time to spend with them between work and cleaning my house and all of the many other commitments of adulthood. And so my solution to this thus far has just been to combine the two. Either I drag my friends along on my errands with me, and that's where we hang out, or I tag along with them on theirs. For example, in the last few years, one of the ways I regularly hang out with my friend Casey is that we go to Sam's Club together. We go buy all the bulk item things, we check out all the samples, of course, and we just chat about life as we do it. Or with my friend Jamie, I show up at her house and I help her clean or build a bookcase or go pick up stuff from the post office, and all the while we share life there together. And honestly, if you invite me over to your house to hang out, but also to organize some of your stuff, I will happily do that. And while these activities are probably a bit less exciting than going on a cool road trip or going out or whatever it is the kids do these days, it doesn't cease to amaze me how much these small daily interactions build up my friendships. Rather than waiting for the perfect activity or for our schedules to align just right, which, spoiler alert, they never ever will. But rather than waiting for that, just doing normal daily life with my friends offers up this space to go deeper. What was previously just a trip to get gas now is a place of connection and care between me and my friend. And that kind of space to share life with someone is really, really valuable. And Jesus shared his life and struggles with the people around him too, and it changed their lives. But this isn't always easy for us to do. We all feel the weight of busyness between work and school and cleaning and clubs and everything else going on in our lives. And that's just assuming things are running smoothly, which if we're being honest, it probably isn't, at least not in all areas. And it's hard to really want to share our lives with others when we feel like we just don't have it together, like we're gonna be judged or criticized, when we feel like we've made a mistake or too many mistakes, and we don't want our guilt and shame exposed to others. But the thing is, when we aren't honest about our own lives and stories, it makes it really hard for our relationships to go deeper and for other people to be honest with us too. Many of us have heard stories or even personally experienced church communities, friend groups, or family structures where the expectation is that you have it together all the time. There's a perfect image even when things are imploding underneath. And when we carry that with us and shy away from being truly authentic and healthy ways with others, it's really hard to go any deeper in our relationships and create the kind of friendships that actually last over time. Without that kind of deep relational context, it's really challenging to go beyond a surface level and share things that matter with people. And people need that kind of deep connection now more than ever. And that space is one where we can share our lived experience of God's love with others. 
And we know that Jesus consistently shared his life with others. And as followers of Jesus, we can model our lives on his. Jesus had an interesting and busy life, but he regularly invited other people into his daily living. And he certainly taught and shared with others in that way too. But he also had a whole group of followers who were with him while he traveled, ate, napped, prayed, and so on. Jesus spent years with his apostles in this way, sharing the truth of God's loving grace while also sharing his lived experience of that love with the people around him. As Brad taught us a few weeks ago, for us to have space to share the good news of God, we need authenticity and engagement to build trust with others. And a big way that Jesus does this across the gospels is by faithfully sharing his life with other people and investing deeply in those relationships. And one of the most compelling ways that we see Jesus do this is in his very vulnerable interactions with his disciples. In Mark 4, there's a story about Jesus on a boat with his disciples when a terrible storm comes up. The waves are starting to break apart the boat and water is getting in and all the while Jesus is asleep. Now, storm aside, sleeping out in just a group of people is a very vulnerable place to be. What if they see you drool or snore? Or what if they're not very trustworthy and they take all your stuff while you're asleep? But Jesus trusts his disciples. And even through this fierce storm, he continues to sleep. But his disciples are not feeling quite so trusting of Jesus. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus has the power to literally control the weather and yet still cares enough for each of his disciples to ask why they are afraid. Jesus is asking if they trust him, if they believe that he will be there for them. And that is a powerful, vulnerable question to put out there. Jesus doesn't just preach at the disciples, but chooses to engage deeply with them, to build trust and authenticity, even when they say and do some pretty dumb stuff. And across the narrative of Jesus, we can see how the truth of God was reflected in how Jesus lived and interacted with others, and the trust and care that those interactions created helped people to follow Jesus and ultimately to draw closer to God. Jesus models what Paul later writes to the Thessalonians. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. We share the good news of who God is by spending time with others faithfully and intentionally sharing our lives and stories with them. In order to grow deeper in our relationships, we must model authenticity and be able to share honestly about our own lives and God's work in them while creating a safe space for others to do the same with us. Consistent engagement with others, building up relationship and trust, opens up opportunities to honestly share God's love with other people. Familiarity and trust are built over time and require us to be faithfully honest, open, and able to really listen to others. And knowing that Jesus shared his life with others regularly, what are some ways that we can start to do that in our own lives? If you're not used to doing this already, then I would encourage you to practice with people you already have relationship with first and then invite less relationally connected people in. Practice sharing in a small group, getting lunch with a friend regularly, or doing what I do and buddying up with someone to run errands. And once you get that, practice inviting others into those patterns and start taking risks on some new people. Create opportunities to share life with people and build trust. That does mean you actually have to share with people and be authentic with them. But that doesn't mean that you need to overshare or dump all of your internal stuff onto someone you just met. But as time and trust are built, it will grow the relationship and create more opportunities to share if you are honest with them. In my grad program, I found myself talking a lot about the emotionally healthy spirituality content that we talk about here a lot at DR. 
And mostly that was because my program loved having people do group papers and assignments, and group work inherently leads to conflict. My friends would complain to me about their group mates, and I generally responded with questions about their unexpressed expectations and how they were communicating with their group. And I shared my experiences with this content and how much it, it had helped me in my conflicts with others, both in school and my personal life and how helpful it had been to our church. And because I was honest with that, people were much more willing to actually try those things out. And this was helpful enough to people that my friends got more comfortable talking to me about these kinds of conflicts and a lot of other stuff too. And once a friend told me, you know, I came here just to complain, but I think I'm walking away being a better person. By opening up to people about my, how my own emotional health was a big part of my life and sharing that honestly with them, my grad school friends were much more willing to share with me and actually listen to what I had to say. Connection, authenticity, and healthy reciprocated sharing helps to build relationships where people are much, much more willing to talk through difficult things with you and even see a different perspective. And there were many people around Jesus who were willing to hear his message and follow him wholeheartedly. And much of that was because Jesus was genuinely sharing his life with them. The people around him heard his story and who he was. And in many cases, they were willing to change their whole lives for that but he also chose to share his struggles with them. Over and over again in the gospels, Jesus is rejected, cursed, and threatened. He shares those moments with his, his disciples and he's honest with them that eventually he is going to die for them. And even though the disciples don't fully understand what that will mean for a while, Jesus still chooses to be vulnerable with them. In the garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion, he asked three of his disciples, to come be with him while he prays and mourns. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Jesus doesn't hide how he feels from them. He's distressed and agonized and desperately wants them to be with him while he tries to process what is about to happen. He's already been sharing about this moment for a while, but here he is fully open about his grief. And he's also open about his disappointment and hurt when the disciples have fallen asleep. Jesus doesn't pretend that everything is all good and he's never bothered by anything. Quite the opposite. Jesus is loving and honest in the same turn, authentically sharing his hurt while still pursuing deep relationship with those around him. And by sharing his struggles with others, even being willing to share his moments of grief and wrestling with God, Jesus deepens those relationships and allows other people to be their full selves alongside him. After Jesus' resurrection, it's not his miracles or his teaching that Jesus uses to, prove, uses to prove who he is, but his wounds. We read in John 20, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Our wounds and scars and struggles also help to define who we are and show us why we are the way we are. They're an important part of our stories and are what make us into real people. Part of what makes the Christian life so worth following is how it uniquely shifts people's perspective of suffering and grace. When we share our struggles, we also share how God meets us in that space. Our narratives of how God has shown up in our lives are powerful, whether it's in the joyful moments or the mundane and the painful ones. Sharing our stories, including sharing our struggles and hurts, 
helps us to deepen relationships and authentically share the God who draws near to us. We are called to share our whole lives with one another, not just the bright and happy parts. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. When we share honestly about our struggles, we are inviting others into our walk with God with us rather than just telling them what to do. It's not about jumping in to fix everything for others or expecting that others or God are just going to make everything go our way but sharing those burdens to build one another up, extend love and grace, and ultimately to show who God is to others through our lives and stories. This kind of commitment to authenticity and love is a powerful testimony to the world of God's character. Paul emphasized this kind of relational care in Colossians. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. When we share our lives authentically, we must do it with love and patience. Being real with people is not an excuse for poor behavior, and we have to model the kind of care and compassion that we ourselves are seeking. A few years ago, I misread the schedule for DR Kids Workers, and I sent a reminder text on Saturday before the Sunday service to the wrong person. And they let me know that they couldn't help that weekend, which was fine because they weren't scheduled in the first place. But rather than checking the schedule again, I panicked and I made the very ungracious assumption that this person was just not gonna show up for their volunteer duties on Sunday. And in my panic, I called them and they didn't answer. So I left a very frustrated voicemail. And of course, right after I left the voicemail, I did check the schedule and realized my mistake. And I felt horrible, but I couldn't take back that grumpy message. I texted them to let them know about the voicemail if they hadn't yet heard it and apologize for it, uh, thinking that I had already hurt them greatly and they probably weren't even going to want to volunteer with the kids anymore because of what I had done. And instead, I received this incredibly gracious response. I won't even listen to it. Not only were they not upset with me, they very kindly just ignored the tense voicemail and gave me the benefit of the doubt. Years later, that act of grace still means a ton to me. And a while after it happened, I ended up actually talking with that person and shared how much their kindness and patience with me in that moment had meant. And what surprised me was actually how positively they viewed that interaction. It was encouraging for them to see that I had honestly admitted my mistake, apologized, and just shown that I wasn't perfect. Now, that does not make it okay that I freaked out at them but it does show that our willingness to share honestly about our imperfections and mistakes, to seek help, to apologize, and everything that comes with sharing our burdens and love can be a really powerful thing in our relationships with others. And part of what makes sharing our honest stories and struggles so hard, or why we might shy away from sharing the gospel, is that we feel like we and others need to kind of fit a certain set of criteria first. We have to have it all together to be perfect. We can't ever have made a mistake. And this mentality is what John Ortberg in his book, Eternity is Now in Session, calls a closed set. There is a defined set of things that make you either in or out of a group. And if you don't meet all of those criteria, then you're not going to belong. We think that if we check off enough boxes, then we will be good enough for God and others. But if we or other people don't meet all of those things, then we just can't share our lives honestly in that space. That's not possible. This mentality keeps us from being authentic with others because we don't want to expose our shortcomings and flaws lest we be found out as not checking off all of those boxes. And in turn, it keeps people from being able to share with us because they're similarly worried about that thing. Another more helpful paradigm that Ortberg illustrates is what we can think of as a bounded set. 
Think of it like a series of circles with our target, in this case, Jesus, at the center. There may be some characteristics that differentiate those different circles, but in this case, the key thing for us to look at is the trajectory. Are we and others moving towards the center, closer to Jesus, or outwards, away from him? And that means that our walk with God is less about trying to look outwardly perfect or never making a mistake than it is about trying to genuinely move towards the center, closer to Jesus. Using a bounded set framework and choosing to share authentically invites others into that trajectory towards Jesus rather than us or other people thinking that we have to reach a certain level of put togetherness uh, in order to belong and to share with others. Choosing authenticity as we share our lives and struggles with others can help us to share the fullness of God's work in our lives, which can be a powerful testimony. I do have a piece of caution here, though, in this discussion of authenticity and sharing our struggles honestly with others. Sharing our struggles does not mean that we make other people into our personal therapist or just gossip about others. We want to be honest with people, but we also need to be mindful that what we are sharing is appropriate to the level of relationship that we have with that person. And that we are not just expecting them to solve our problems for us or just venting. We are called to share our burdens in love with one another. And that requires us to develop a healthy self-awareness of ourselves and trust in our relationships to do that well. Remember, sharing our lives and our struggles with others is the third step in what we've talked about. We have to develop a foundation of trust and hospitality before we just jump right into the steps. The depth of sharing should match the depth of relationship. Is the relationship strong and robust enough to bear the weight of what you are sharing with that person? Your sharing is also creating a safe space for others to share. But if what you are opening up about now shuts the, down the other person's ability to be vulnerable, then it's possible that you're oversharing with them. And we do this for a variety of reasons. Maybe we've been burned in the past in our relationships for being vulnerable. So now when we meet a new person, we try and share a ton of really difficult things really quickly to see if they'll stick around or to try and fast forward into the depths of vulnerability and trust in a relationship that we crave. Or it might be that we're so uncomfortable with our own emotions and hurts that we discharge them onto other people trying to seek some kind of relief. And in any of these cases, it ends up short-circuiting authenticity by making it really hard for the other person to be honest and vulnerable with us too. In her book, Daring Greatly, Brene Brown uses a metaphor of twinkle lights to share what healthy sharing can look like. Ordinarily, when we reach out and share ourselves, our fears, hopes, struggles, and joy, we create small sparks of connection. Our shared vulnerability creates light in normally dark places. My metaphor for this is twinkle lights. The lights are small and a single light is not very special but an entire strand of sparkling lights is sheer beauty. It's the connectivity that makes them beautiful. When it comes to vulnerability, connectivity means sharing our stories with people who have earned the right to hear them. People with whom we've cultivated relationships that can bear the weight of our story. Alternatively, when we share too deeply too fast, especially short stories with deep shame or hurt in them, with someone that doesn't have the level of relationship and connectivity with us. It's like shining a floodlight into their eyes instead of those twinkle lights. The shared vulnerability is blinding and too much weight for the relationship to bear. And this can lead to either an immediate fracture, shutting people off from wanting to share further with us, or unintentionally manipulating people into sharing beyond what they're comfortable, creating a false sense of intimacy in the relationship without the depth of relational connectivity needed to actually sustain it. Either of these outcomes is really unhelpful to the health of the relationship long-term. Deep, healthy relationships require both trusting vulnerability 
and dependable faithfulness from people. If we aren't authentic and vulnerable with others, choosing to honestly share life with them, then those relationships will never move past a surface level. In order to develop deep relationships where we can reflect the love of God in our lives and stories, we have to choose to let go of trying to look perfect for other people and instead be honest with them about what's going on in our lives. And at the same time, we have to actually develop those dependable, faithful relationships where we can do this. We practice trusting others with small things before we share everything with them. And we see if they are trustworthy with that information and willing to reciprocate sharing with us. From there, we create those twinkling lights of shared connectivity that lead to truly beautiful relationships. And as you think about how to implement this in your own life and relationship, relationships, you may be realizing that this requires a pretty high level of awareness of your own emotions and internal world. And that's a good thing. When we're able to work through our own stories, thought processes, and emotions, we get better at being able to share them with others and to not shy away from other people's stories. This week, try incorporating some regular time for self-reflection. One tool that's really helpful for this is journaling. Um, but if you're someone like me who gets super overwhelmed by the idea of trying to journal every single little thing I'm thinking, I recommend finding some like guided journal prompts, maybe a sentence a day, that kind of thing to help keep it more focused so that you kind of just get into the habit regularly of reflecting on what your internal world looks like. It's also helpful to engage in spiritual practices that invite slowing down and being with your own thoughts like taking intentional time for silence and solitude, or responding to God's words slowly and intentionally through Electio Divina. All of those things can be really helpful in building up that kind of healthy awareness of our internal worlds and emotions. And you may be really interested in sharing with others and going deeper, but you just don't quite know who to start with. Brene Brown has some great questions to help us identify trusting relationships that we can practice sharing in. Is there trust here? Is there mutual empathy? Is there reciprocal sharing? Is it just you sharing about your life or do both of you share equally? And can we ask for what we need in that relationship? And we can use these questions to help us identify relationships where we can already start to go deeper and to know what we need to develop in our other relationships to build the foundation for that kind of authenticity down the line. And when we do share, we also need to choose authenticity and patience over a perfect image. Rather than cover up our mistakes and shortcomings, be honest about them and be willing to share those with others. And when those people are brave enough to share their own flaws and mistakes with us, show that same kind of care and patience to them too. And as we share more and move into sharing about God's work in our lives, we can also practice being open about what our thought processes are when it comes to God and life, not just the simple answers. Where have you struggled? What has helped you to find answers? How have you come to know the things that you know now? And what's still messy and hard for you? Our stories are really powerful and they don't have to come with a tidy resolution and a bow on top to be impactful for others. When we are willing to engage in the messy and beautiful reality of walking with God in our lives, we invite others to authentically do the same. That kind of honesty and care is not always common in our world, and people are going to notice it. We reveal who God is in our lives and relationships with others. Jesus even told his disciples that people would come to know God by their love for one another. Jesus is truth, and that truth was revealed by his being with us, not just teaching us what to do, but in being in genuine, close relationship among his people. God didn't just send us a memo on how to live well or how to just obey God, but a son to live among us. That relational witness is powerful, and it's that image of relationship and authenticity that we are called to model to a broken and relationally fractured world. We are the hope on this earth, Christ's ambassadors that are joining in the work of God to grow God's kingdom everywhere. 
our stories and struggles, hard and imperfect as they may be, help us to draw closer to one another. And in that closeness, I hope and pray each of us can see God more clearly and share that with the world. Please pray with me. Lord, I thank you for our stories. I thank that you have, you that you've crafted each of us so perfectly and individually in whatever context that we find ourselves in, God, we can learn to see your work and your care in it, that you put us in the community so that we can share our burdens and love with one another, God. I pray that you give us the bravery to do that well, to love others well when they share their burdens with us, God, and that we can be a community of authenticity and care that invites people in, not because of how, what they can do for us, how perfect they may look, um, but because they're people. And all of us are deserving of your love and care, God. We thank you, God, for your incredible witness to us in Jesus, for that relationship and care that you so graciously lavished upon us. We love you, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.